This is Joseph Coco. I'm at Ape 2017 on behalf of Becky Holborn's Art Process blog and YouTube channel. If you could introduce yourself, Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen Russell Black. Okay. Um, Bay Area artist. I do uh, creepy horror stuff. Um, nice. Uh, so do you think horror is a good fit for Ape? I mean, I see quite a bit of uh, different things here. Some, some more horror, some more anime inspired, some more cartoony. Um, sure. Where do you, how do you feel that people walking around are responding to your work? Uh, it's definitely a smaller group of the larger population are my people, but uh, they, yeah. they, they come and find me out, so uh, I'm happy happy for that. Cool. But uh, no, Ape's, Apes a great show, um, celebrating all alternative uh, creators, so always happy to be here. Okay. Is this your first time coming? This is my third show, third time being at Ape. Okay. So, um, I can't remember when it moved from uh, San Francisco back to San Jose. Uh, it was your first in San Francisco, or you first, started? First show was in San, uh, San Jose, yeah. So I've been doing the show as long as Dan uh, has taken the show back over. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about uh, how the show has progressed uh, since it's come here? Um, I, th I think it's the same. It's, all, it's all the same creators. We just changed cities. Like it's all. It's all kind of the same. Okay. Same people and uh, energy and stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> I know Dan just wanted to bring it back home to San Jose. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I can't remember. If, uh, we went uh, to the. Our first was the last time it was in San Francisco. Yeah, for me. Uh, we didn't table there. We were uh, just attending. But um, uh, yeah, I can't remember if we met him there. But it it makes sense that he would want to bring it back because. Uh, he was more interested in putting it more back in creators of uh, independent comic type works uh, hands. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about uh, your background in art? Um, what are some of the inspirations for your pieces and uh, how did you decide to um, do horror work? Um, so I grew up in a little town in Ohio and uh, I, there's nothing really to do but live inside your own head and I fell in love with uh, Stephen King novels. Okay. So that's kind of where the creepy stuff comes from. And then uh, the other inspiration that was big up for me was uh, uh, the paintings of Dali. So I love surreal, surreal horror stuff. Uh, and I, actually, the first Stephen King book that I got was uh, uh, The Stand, and it had illustrations by Bernie Wrightson, and I just fell in love with like those illustrations and, oh. and what it meant to be an illustrator and that kind of stuff. So that was my first first kind of uh, first love was the, the horror stuff with uh, Bernie and Stephen King, and so that stuck. And that's, I've loved that ever since. Okay. Uh, what type of shows do you normally table at? I know some horror people have good luck at like tattoo shows and that sort of thing. Yeah, Monster Palooza in uh, Pasadena uh, is my, my favorite show. Okay. Um, it's kind of an industry show for people who do uh, creature design and uh, movie makeup special effects. Yeah, yeah, uh, I was about to ask that. Yeah, so um, there's a few 2D artists, myself and uh, Alan Williams and a couple other people, but uh, mostly it's uh, for special effects. So a lot of sculptors. Um, but it, it just it slants all towards horror and monsters. Okay. And um, I know there's been a, a pretty big surge in uh, horror games, um, like independent, low-budget horror games coming out. Uh, have you dabbled in that any? Or, I don't or, do a lot of interested? commercial work. Um, okay. It's mostly fine art. The commercial work that I do do is uh, very few like uh, comic book covers um, sure. or personal commissions for people, um, but not, no gaming. Okay. Makes sense. Um, so, I know you traded with Becca uh, the compilation of your work. Um, is this self-published or...? Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, I ran a Kickstarter for, the, for book one and book two. Uh, and actually the third uh, Kickstarter a week ago uh, to fund the third book. Cool. About how long do you spend just on average on, on a piece? Do you, um, is that something you kind of plan ahead of time? I don't uh, plan and, them ahead of time unless it's for a commission or a cover. Right, because um, then, then that way I'll do the traditional like uh, I'll, I'll do doodles and I show that to, to the the director and then we go for a fi more final drawing and then that gets refined and then a final painting. Um, but the pieces I do for myself are just stream of conscious out of my head. I'll start with a face and then just let it turn into whatever it turns into. Um, okay. And that might that might mean it fails and I throw it away. Yeah. Um, or it might mean I, I find something really unexpected and beautiful, but uh, that's the chance that I'm happy to take on those personal pieces. Um, they take about three to six hours for the drum. And then uh, paintings, of course, take about a week or two. So it seems like horror, uh, I'm sure a lot of art forms are like this, but you probably need to take in um, a, a variety of, of work to try to figure out uh, how you can uniquely express your vision in something that's 
um, terrifying, I guess. Uh, where do you where do you go to try to find inspiration for for a piece? I mean, oh, sure. you said you kind of just start playing with things and see what comes out of it, but yeah, I'm sure I also, you have to be fueling your subconscious somehow oh, yeah. in order for so, that to work out. Yeah, so I'm also I'm, I'm visiting like um, the Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, okay. um, and Natural History Museum in LA, um, and I'm just, I'm constantly taking photos of like. Um, skeletons and, and pictures of my friends screaming and like just like we you know like just take constantly taking in like um, and documenting as much reference and, and things as possible and then kind of like taking that stuff all in and then when I uh, combine it uh, make sense of it and then put it back out is kind of the work that I going to create okay and do you do the gallery scene very much I do um, I show at a gallery in Davis California called the Pence Okay. Um, and I'll have a one-man show there in December of next year. Um, awesome. So far, I've just been doing group shows with them. And I also show at Sketchpad Gallery in San Francisco. Okay. Um, how did you develop the contacts for that? People just see you at shows, or you're directly reaching out to Everything people? these days seems to go through Facebook. Like, you post some stuff on Facebook, and then someone will message you, like, hey, do you want to do this gallery show? And you're like, okay, and then you do one, and it kind of leads to, people see you in that, that space, nice. and then it leads to so more. So you're just regularly putting out your work online, and... Hopefully somebody will find you. It's, yeah, I, I, I put out stuff daily. So um, I'll start the drawing in the morning and I'll post that. And then later in the afternoon when I've kind of turned it into something else, I'll, I'll post it and I, and I post when the finish comes out. And uh, and if it's a painting and I'm working on for a week, I'll, I'll post daily like the progress of the piece until it's finished. And um, through that process of posting, like um, making content daily, like keeps people coming back and keeps spreading the art, you know, farther and farther. Sure. Uh, what mediums do you work in mostly? The drawings are all Prismacolor and charcoal on tone paper. Okay. Uh, and the paintings are all oil. Yeah, I kind of had that feel, but I sometimes can't tell. People, Some people have gotten really good at faking things, di well, faking, I guess might not be the appropriate word, emulating things digitally. Oh, sure, so yeah. Want to ask to be sure. Absolutely, and especially if you've only seen a print, like you, you, you sometimes they're, they're a really good painter and they just happen to be you know, use digital and it's like, oh, yeah. that's a killer painting. And you're like, well, it's a Photoshop piece. And you're like, yeah, but it's still a killer painting. Like, <laughs> yeah, um, well, it's just sad that there's not a physical like relic. And mm -hmm. I'm really into, um, um, so the, the, the piece are just like, you know, visual communications kind of stuff. You're just, you're putting your thoughts on the paper and you're like trying, you know, hoping that someone else understands what you're, you're doing. But the, the physical originals and having that big oil painting, that's like this thing that you labored over and you like the, you see the mark making. So it's just it's such a more visceral, like reaction when someone sees that in person and yeah especially um, with the textures i feel yeah. like that can add a whole lot to horror really yeah and i just i love that the art object as a relic like mm -hmm. um because the the pieces online are what people are interacting with and, and excited about or sharing or or that's kind of their daily experience with my work yeah um but the pieces are this relic of like this is the thing i actually worked on and i, I just i think that that's cool yeah so how often do people actually reach out to you online and say hey you've been posting this thing can i buy it <laughs> Often, actually, I, I, nice. um, the paintings are all sold, and I just have a few drawings left that I brought to the show. But um, that is, luckily, that is um, um, a great problem to have because I, 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 when I come to these shows, I don't always have a lot of stuff to share or bring to sell. Because uh, as since I post them as they're being made, if someone connects to a piece and they, they want it, then I'll, I'll sell it to them right away. Okay. And you talked about doing a few of the comic book covers. Um, how did you develop those relationships? Uh, again, is that just something Facebook? Yeah. Uh, somebody saw your work online and said, "Hey, would you consider doing some commercial work for me?" Totally. Usually, it's I've never I've sent stuff into to publishers before and never had a bite. But um, yeah. it's usually the writers fall in love with my work and then say, "Hey, I want your stuff on my cover." And, yeah. Uh, and then it goes from there. But um, yeah. Yeah, I've talked to some horror writers, and as if I can recall, that's how they uh, met up with with their um, respective artists. Is that um, you know the work spoke to them, and they just developed a relationship and said, "Hey, well, let's do this." You know, I've got this portion of the book written. Can you you know create a cover for me based on what I have? Yeah. Um, yeah, which is a much more fun like personal relationship than like maybe some. It might be a little more sterile if you just send in like blind samples and like a, a, some art director like, oh, I'll give you give you a job. And you're, and you're this is uh, but this is more special because you know that the writer is a fan of your work and, and wanted it on the on the cover. So yeah, like that's really special, and I'll, I'll always do that. Rather than you just selling to some company and that company trying to sell it to some other company. Or yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how often do you actually bring original pieces to shows? Um, as often as I have them. Okay. Um, um, and then sometimes I'm trying to I'm trying to hold some back now. Um, talking to other other artists, uh, it's hard though because you, you make stuff and I, I immediately want to share it. Yeah. Um, so I'm always putting everything as I'm doing it like online on, on Instagram. 
Um, but I'm learning now I need to hold a few pieces back to have these nice reveals at shows. Yeah. So people coming to a, a given uh, show like Ape or Monster Blues or something have something Yeah, even if they're a super the, fan, it's something new and fresh for them. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's like something that's a, a unique exclusive just that they saw it first there. Okay. That's some good advice. Um, so how do you decide uh, the pricing for different shows? Because you mentioned you did kind of a variety of things. Do you basically price the same across the board, whether you're doing an independent show or more of um, a, a horror show? I do price um, the same all across the board. Okay. Um, it's And that's difficult also with gallery work because they take 50% of your sales. Um, yeah. So you can't immediately bump your prices up to reflect, like to try to get the same numbers because it's just not fair to um, to the end. Patrons at that. Yeah, yeah. patrons. So, um, but prices um, are, are are the same across the board for everything. Okay. Um, and then they, they slowly rise from year to year um, yeah. as you're making more complex pieces and the work's getting better. Yeah, well, you need to reward yourself for all the time that you put into your pieces. Yeah, I mean, just because sure. it's taking you the same amount of time doesn't mean you, it isn't of more value. Sure. I mean, it actually takes you less, it seems to, uh, as the years go on, it takes you less time because you get like really proficient at um, doing things and you start to do things quicker. So you, sure. you, you actually, it actually uh, gets even better because you're, you're, even if you had the same amount or had prices at the same amount, like as you go, you're getting better and faster. And, yeah. Well, I just know like, for instance, with webcomic artists, uh, what they'll often do is um, not in terms of selling things necessarily, but when they start a webcomic, uh, they might not um, have the skill to produce the quality of the piece they want. So as they learn new skills, they end up taking a little longer on the comic pages because uh, they have they can devote more time to make it look like what they had originally intended to. So uh, yeah. that's what I was going at in terms of... But I, I guess um, what you're referring to is basically you've, you're happy with the quality of everything you're putting out, so now at this point it's just time savings as you're learning sure. uh, to do techniques faster and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah, but you're, you're, constantly, you're always constantly evolving and trying new stuff and... Yeah. and um, um, a new texture, a new thing, uh, uh, you know, something like. But uh, man, comics also that can be like super tough too, because that's a that's a time sink. Like you could you could put so much work into each individual page, but when people read through the book, like they you know they they're done in like they read the book in like ten minutes, but like it took you like months and months to like you know put this thing yeah, together. So exactly, especially if it's light in the dialogue, it's like. Some people won't even really take a moment to appreciate this be beautiful crowd scene that you rendered. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I spent five times longer on that than all these other pages, but because there's no dialogue, you're just going to blow right past that, oh, aren't totally. you? Totally. <laughs> totally. It's also like that, that weird disconnect for the writer, too. Like, the writer will just say, oh, it's a, you know, a two-page splash scene of, like, a you know giant landscape or whatever, right? And he, took, he takes, like, two seconds to write that, and then the artist is like, oh, like, takes two days to have to draw <laughs> all that stuff, right? Right. Um, so I noticed that um, this is book one. That's book one. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Because I, you said you were releasing the third now, uh, and I saw the two different colors. So it just actually occurred to me that they were um, separate books. Uh, so what made you decide to uh, compile everything into um, an art book? Uh, you just wanted to make your work available to. A larger crowd, or you felt like it was basically a, a good portfolio. I thought it was a um, it was a good time to like uh, commemorate all the hard work that I put in. Actually, that was kind of the impetus for um, on Instagram. I was a few years ago. I was trying to build a following, so what I would do is I would um, do an 11 by 17 finished drawing every day, um, and I did it for 72 days in a row before I kind of hit a wall and was like couldn't go anymore. And, um, pretty good. Yeah, no, it was fun. Uh, I was exhausted at the end of that, but it, it, it did what I was trying to achieve and build a, a large following, and it, it um, got my eyeballs on the work. And um, <laughs> so that first book really was just trying to um, take all that stuff, that hard work that I put in that year, and um, remember it by yeah, putting thanks. everything into a book and to kind of remember the, the work that I put in. And was there much uh, like cleanup that you had to do, uh, scanning all this work and? Um, getting it so that it was uh, published ready, or for the no, most part, I mean, after I, you finish a piece, you just digitize it? It's part of my process when I'm doing the piece. As I work on it, I'm, I'm documenting it by um, sharing to Instagram, and then when the piece is finished, okay. scanning. So yeah, it, so at it that was point, it's just done. laying it out and then writing the sizes and all that sort of thing. Totally. Okay. Um, so I did want to ask, do you have the books in stores locally? 
Um, I, Stuart Ng Books carries my stuff. They have a website. Um, he's out of Los Angeles. And then uh, a couple of shops around San Francisco, uh, but mostly through my Etsy store. Right. Uh, and where can we find your work online? Uh, if Everything uh, filters through Instagram. So if, you, if you're on Instagram and you find me on there, it's Stephen Russell Black. Uh, and then there's links to everything else through that. Okay. And I also show once a month on uh, a website called everydayoriginal.com. What is it? Uh, it's called everydayoriginal.com. Okay. So each day of the month, a different artist has uh, posts something. Uh, and they're, they're small works. Uh, and they're meant to be like um, uh, small, bite-sized like, kind of things. And everything's priced under $500 for new collectors or um, collectors that are looking for a smaller smaller piece. And um, that's been a really fun, fun place to, to show my work as well. OK. Uh, and I noticed that you had um, a newsletter sign-up form on your table. Yep. Um, I've been hearing more independent creators talk about how important it is to build an audience through a newsletter because um, all these social networking sites seem to be kind of ephemeral. Uh, one is popular and then it's less popular. Um, what's been, what, what have you found? It sounds like you built quite the audience on Instagram, so um, obviously you are hitting, and Facebook, so you're hitting social media pretty hard. Sure. But um, what made you decide to also do a newsletter and uh, how do you feel like that audience is different than your social networking audiences? Um, I think then I think sometimes the new the mailing list can be people that aren't really on social media, or okay. um, and so it's also like a more direct contact because um, they might not see it like uh, they might go on social media and go off. And the way yeah. that the the analytics of Facebook work now, like um, a post might not necessarily have been seen by everyone um, unless it was a popular thread. Yeah. Um, and so the mailing list just, it, at least you saw it, like it, it goes to you and like you, you know, you have to delete it, the email before you, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's yeah, on Unless your... you're spamming, there's no filter for yeah. email. Right? Yeah. It, let's say in some of it's people who have signed up, so they, they asked to be on the, the yeah, list. Of course. But, um, but at least you have to like, it's in your inbox and you have to like either look at it or like just ex at least see the headline that I have a new something coming out and before you delete it. So I know that people are at least seeing those. And, um, okay. So you just wanted to make sure that your um, the people who followed you could keep up with everything that you were doing if they wanted to. Yeah, even if they missed something, because I know, um, like, I just did the third Kickstarter, and there's someone who had supported the first two, and was like, "Oh, I hadn't, I hadn't seen, the, I didn't even know they had a third book out." It's like, yeah, just a lot I, of information coming in. Sure, so. and then I feel like I'm a broken record every day, like during the Kickstarter, because you're like, "Look at the campaign, look at the campaign," like, <laughs> and um, yeah, there's only know, so many ways, so yeah, many different ways you can say, "Look at the know, campaign." Like, I, I, I just want to share the work, but like. Um, during that Kickstarter period, like you're just you're a broken right? you're, you're, because you're constantly sharing the link, sharing the link, yeah, um, and finding new ways to share the link. You know, like like here's here's some design stuff I did, or here's here's like this thing that we're doing, and, and different aspects of the the book. But you sort of run out of like things to you know to say, and you're just kind of like pushing that link constantly. And so I feel Don't like a broken forget. record. But then at yeah. a certain there's, at the same point too, someone told me yesterday that like oh I didn't I didn't know a third book was coming out. So it's like <laughs> you know you got to do all the things to try to to try to get the word out on your on your projects. Right. So. Um, I don't, we don't, we back a lot of comic stuff on Kickstarter, but we haven't looked too much into the fine art world of Kickstarter. Um, are art books uh, from fine artists um, big on Kickstarter? Yeah, uh, I think so, okay. uh, for sure. There's been a couple of books. Uh, 44 Flood was like uh, a company that did like a really, really big one. Um, yeah, art books are pretty popular on there. Okay. Um, I think they're probably less prevalent because comics just seem to come out super fast. Like, like yeah. indie creators are putting out like you know individual issues like pretty often on there, and, and even trades and things they come out fast. So I think the art books come out less frequently. Yeah, but, um, it, it definitely seems to be much more rare for um, a comic to have a milestone for a hardback. I think it just seems like the people on Kickstarter uh, probably aren't looking to spend that much money on an individual right. comic, but there are exceptions like um becca was just part of an anthology thousand and one nights uh where the most basic tier for the full set of comics is a hundred dollars yeah uh because it's like a three hard volume bound set it's a high and, entry point for a lot of people you yeah know, especially like a like ape or, or a certain comic show if you're, if you're coming specifically for like zines or indie creators that are doing like comics you're yeah you're, you're gonna spend, spend like two dollar, to five dollars yeah you know, ten dollars at the most on a trade maybe like so so a hundred dollar price point probably prices out some people, but um, yeah. So it's the same thing. Art books can be a little more, a little more pricey, and so that it might not be on people's radar uh, just because it's a higher price point. But sure. Okay, and finally, would you have some advice to an artist who's considering or a writer who's considering tabling at um, Ape for the first time? Uh, I would say come to the show and walk around and kind of know like know the playing field before you. 
uh, jump in and play and um, ask okay. everybody their kind of experiences and, and um, also know what it is that you, like the work that you're trying to put out and what form that takes and how best to present it um, right. would, be, would be good questions to ask specifically. And then um, once you have that, that playing field kind of laid out, then you can go in very analytically and, and line up all of the, the chores and tasks and things that you need to accomplish to be able to come and, and do it successfully. All right, that sounds great. And thank you, Stephen. I yeah. hope you have a great day. Thanks, man.